Good evening, Holliston, and welcome to the Monday, August 30th, 2021 meeting of the Select Board. Um, you'll notice that at the head of the table, we have Chief Cassidy with us this evening. He is acting town administrator um, for the week as Travis Ahern is um, away this week. So we welcome you to the table. Happy to have you. And thank you for stepping into the role to serve as a um, interim. This is not acting town administrator this week. So we're going to, so he plays multiple roles, wears many hats tonight because not only is he acting town administrator um, with agenda item number five under his belt, he'll also handle one and two, both the COVID-19 community update and the CARES Act and the ARPA programmatic update. So I guess I hand the mic over to you, Chief Cassidy. Grateful. Thank you. So it's, Nice to be seen from profile as opposed to just seeing the shiny spot on the back of my head. Um, in terms of our COVID update, I wanted to share where we are. It's been a while since I've provided an update. Um, since your last meeting on Thursday, we've had five additional new cases. Uh, but the good news is we've had 12 people recover since our meeting last Thursday. We have had no new COVID related fatalities. Uh, we currently have 15 active cases, so for a population of roughly 15,000, that is one-tenth of one percent of our population is considered to be currently an active case. Those are spread out over 14 addresses because we have one cluster at single family home. We have a dozen individual cases at single family homes and one single case at a multi-family dwelling. In terms of our a uh, weekly summary, you see that we continue to uh, have a very small portion that are active cases in comparison to our overall case count. But I did want to show a different way of looking at the data. And this looks at active cases is the green line at any given time since the uh, pandemic began, whereas the new cases are noted in the orange. Compare what that looks like to the state graph, uh, we have a very similar uh, path that has been charted for Holliston. You see the peaks in the same times. Uh, and as you can see, both the state cases as well as our cases are continuing to dip off in this current uh, uptick. So we like that trend. Uh, this is a familiar graph to you before. Uh, this was uh, something that we've seen. Previously, where we are looking not only at our positivity, comparing that to that of the state positivity, we were also seeing testing numbers, and then we are seeing the risk designation as determined by uh, the state. So obviously, the last couple of weeks, we've been in the yellow. Before that, we were in the green for one week, and we have been in the red for a few months. <clears throat> we continue to be very high in our vaccination. To continue to encourage anyone who has not yet received the vaccination that they are able to do so, that uh, we would encourage them to do that. They're readily available at a lot of pharmacies, as well as there are still vaccination clinics being conducted in the region. I know there's one coming up at Mass Bay and Ashland uh, that will take place in the afternoon on a weekday to try and capture some of the school age children that are eligible. We do want to continue, obviously, to encourage folks to, to get the vaccine. I did want to talk briefly about uh, last week's decision by the FDA, where they did uh, approve uh, the first uh, vaccine that's not under an EUA. And when the approval was given, it is functionally the same dosage as what they previously <coughs> been administering under the EUA. So right now they'll continue to use the same vials for the 12 to 15 year olds and then anyone over 16 uh, could either be getting the previously labeled vials or once they get to market the comernity, which uh, the name for the approved drug vaccine comes from a blend of community and they put mRNA in the middle of that and they're trying to go for the herd immunity as well. So that's where this, this naming uh, convention came up with. So there is hope that uh, those that may have been vaccine hesitant in the past because 
they were under a new way. I'd like to now that there is approval of at least one, and the other manufacturers have submitted their paperwork for approval as well. There might continue to be um, some folks who may have been uh, reluctant to get it in the past because it was under EUA that they might uh, go ahead and get it out. <coughs> Did want to talk briefly about mask mandates. Uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has instituted a mask requirement for pre-K through 12 schools, which of course does impact the Boston public schools. It's through October 1st. Uh, any student staff or visitor to the buildings will be required in indoor settings to be wearing a mask mandate, unless of course they meet certain uh, exemptions. And then in parallel to that, last week, MIAA, which oversees and regulates the interscholastic activities of our schools, also issued a uh, very similar time frame requirement for indoor sports activities. And so that's the locations in town right now, which have a mass mandate through October 1st, and that could be lifted earlier, depending on metrics, or it could be extended later, depending on metrics. But I do want to give a plug that the Holliston Board of Health tomorrow evening uh, will be having a discussion starting at 7.15 regarding masking here in Holliston. And I welcome public feedback. And if you are not able to attend the meeting via Zoom, you are welcome to submit written comment to Scott Moles, the health director, and that can be entered into the record prior to them uh, having their discussion or as part of them having their discussion. Thank you. Any questions on the recently resurrected COVID community update? John? No questions. Ben? Uh, just one quick question. Um, do we know how many of the active cases we have are breakout cases? We do not have access to that information. But I can tell you that statistically, close to 80% uh, is one estimate that I've heard on public health uh, conference calls on breakthrough cases. Break cases. Close to 80% of this. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you to go back to that slide that looks at the vaccine rates, but perhaps that's not the case. In terms of positivity and um, vaccinated, and certainly in terms of overall. Um, negative impact of the virus for sure hospitalizations and some serious complications for sure but in terms of our positivity rate it may not be the most important right so this this is part of the conversation that i've been having with the board of health is that the positivity rate and the active cases are both data points to be used in a discussion with regards to mitigation measures to be taken but a year ago when we were looking at um, you know, surge, even back in January, you know, that was just as the vaccine was starting to be available to those who were in congregate care settings or working in healthcare. So a very large case count in excess of 100 was very different than right now a case count of 15. And even if the super majority of those are breakthrough cases, their symptoms are less, <coughs> their experience is not as uh, adverse. And sometimes people are asymptomatically getting positive test results and not even knowing absence of tests that, that they had it. So um, it's, it's, you were comparing two different operating paradigms. Mm -hmm. All right, um, no other questions. Do we have any questions from members here in the room or on the Zoom call for Chief Cassidy in terms of the COVID-19 community update? I'm not seeing any, so we're going to move on. Thank you to number two, which is the CARES Act and ARPA programmatic update. Uh, we have COVID update twice, so we're just going to knock that one off and talk about CARES and ARPA here. So we'll start with CARES Act okay. and then ARPA, please. Great. So uh, earlier today, I did send a quick snapshot that shows what has been posted to Munis so far for the municipal CARES spending and also some projections for uh, what our balance could be through the end of October, which is our period by which we need to obligate all of our CARES funds. I am aware of a few other pending requests that will be coming to the board. Uh, I do know that tomorrow evening on their agenda, the Board of Health is expected to discuss additional requests for surveillance for the months of July through October. The board had previously 
approved uh, through June for surveillance. And they at times have had some region 4A funding available for surveillance, but right now they do not. So that would probably be a amount of approximately $10,000. I know that facilities is seeking a quote for modifications to the social distancing measures that were installed outside of the building department uh, to reconfiguration the reconfigure the window opening. I uh, don't have that, that quote back yet. And I've been in conversations with uh, the technology director with regards to some additional remote meeting setup and possibly another Zoom license and a couple other enhancements that would facilitate remote uh, telework capacity. But other than that, we still need to uh, identify some possible other eligible uses of CARES between now and the end of October. Okay. So I think there's you know some content there to talk about here with the board. So we obviously don't want to return a balance to the state. No, that is not a goal or priority, something that we want to see done. We projected a balance through December of this year of 121,000 after those mentions you just had. Um, that is prior to any of those votes. So that was through what the board approved last Thursday. Okay. So <clears throat> with those, where we are today, we're still looking at a substantial balance. You are looking for some guidance and put from this board in terms of where we would. Yeah, based on, on the successes of what we've done in the past, is there anything that you would like to provide me with guidance as emergency management director to go back to other departments and encourage them to, if they report to an independent board or committee, to propose something else that might be CARES eligible that the board could consider uh, approving? Uh, I, I think. For example, rent mortgage relief. We've had a couple of very successful rounds of that. It's been a little while since we've offered that. A lot of people are back to work, but there's still some people in town that are facing housing insecurity. I know that the board has approved funding for the senior center with their meals and delivery program through the end of October, but does the board want me to go back and push the council on aging and urge them to do more from a food insecurity standpoint? Do we want to talk with our, our friends at the pantry shelf and see if there's some initiative where we can partner with them to address food insecurity in our community? And I, don't, I don't want to give money away, but at the same time, if, if there's a a need in our community that a group or organization is aware of and it's a CARES eligible expense. Mm -hmm. The purpose of these funds is to help our community. And so if someone knows of a need and we just need to find out who the best municipal or non-governmental champion is to address that, let's do it. Okay. You have not <clears throat> contacted those departments at this point in time to say that there looks to be a balance we'd like to hear from you again. I wanted to get a little, get a little direction from you before I, I do that. So we're not looking at a situation where it's been crickets. The offer has not been made. <laughs> no, okay. no, I, I, they, they don't really see fund balance. They just have made requests as <clears throat> either in their normal course of operations or as a need was made known to them. But uh, I'm happy to, to find the pump if you think we're at that point. Okay. We'll see what John and Ben have to say as well. And uh, there was another similar pie chart that had it in percentage. Yes. Are you able to pull that up or no? That had been developed by the town of Best Fair, so I don't have that. Okay, because I distinctly remember that in the category of housing and food insecurity, it was 8%. Okay. So it, again, if, if the board came up with a concept and wanted to specify a specific dollar amount that was your target, or sorry, not dollar amount, but percentage amount that was your target in a particular area, we could certainly try and you know, pursue that. Okay, I'm not sure, that, that wasn't actually my point, except to say that it was, <clears throat> up until this conversation tonight, a relatively small percentage yes. of the total funds that the town received. Well, I, I think we have a bit to talk about, so I'm interested to hear what John and Ben have to say. 
before we give Chief Cassidy some direction as emergency management director. So a um, couple of things. Um, yes, I'd like to see more on rent and mortgage relief. Yes, I'd like to see more relief given to the restaurants and uh, uh, in town that uh, I believe we gave relief to about a year ago against their uh, town owned, uh, their town levy fees. I can call how much that was. It's 50% off of certain permits. Correct. Do you know what the aggregated amount of that was? Oh, it was, it was less than 10. Less than 10. And then finally, um, um, with booster shots uh, looming, it, it occurs to me that there was some, some issue regarding trying to get seniors to the locations where the vaccines were going to be dispersed. We talked about using Tommy's taxis and a couple of other solutions. If we're going to be looking to giving the same population a booster shot, could we, through our new council aging director, revisit a, a similar situation now with um, using funds from this to provide transportation of these elders to those locations? It's a great idea. I know the board had initially <laughs> approved a dollar amount to be able to cover that sort of an initiative, and then that was covered by another funding source. So we, we didn't end up needing to use that, but we certainly, and again, there's been a change of personnel, so we can let them know the history there. Mm -hmm. And right now, because there is such a higher inventory of vaccines available compared to the requests, they're actually doing in-home administration. So previously, you had to meet very, very strict criteria for them to go into your home. Right now, even if you don't meet a lot of those criteria, they'll still come to you and administer a simple shot just because. But again, it's good to get that on their radar because the guidance around boosters has not been released. Uh, there's some discussion whether it's eight months after initial administration, whether there's going to be a recommendation to move that up to five months after administration, and boosters are different than what is already authorized, which is a third shot in the series for those that have received Pfizer or Moderna, where certain people who meet eligibility criteria, and, and it's self-certified. Um, self you, know, you don't need a doctor's note to, to get that third dose in the series right now. I guess more broadly, my reaching back to the COA director to find out if there's any way these resources can help that population before the end of December. Last item, um, we gave you some homework last week, and you're going to check on possibly moving um, the expanding online resources for library patrons item. Yes, from ARPA to to CARES. That would be about nineteen thousand some change. Right. So I'll throw those four out there, Tina, and mm -hmm. see what's there. So with regards to ARPA 22009 uh, proposal, mm -hmm. uh, I did review that. Uh, <laughs> the closest links under CARES would have been accelerated telework capacity and school distance learning. So that's really not a good match under attachment A from the DLS for CARES, whereas uh, it was a very close match for equity focused services, additional flexibility for hardest hit communities and families to address health disparities, invest in housing, address educational disparities and promote healthy childhood environments. So I, I still feel that it's a better match for ARPA uh, as opposed to trying to shoehorn it into a CARES uh, appropriation. Thank you. Um, uh, some of my uh, comments probably be uh, overlap with uh, Mr. Brown. I, I do think rental mortgage relief is something we should look at again. Um, but personally, um, I would very much uh, like to see if we can do it with our food insecurity, okay? um, whether it's with the sea white population or other populations, just to make sure that people are hungry and need some support in that respect. I think that's very important. So those are the two main areas that I would advocate for. Um, whatever uh, organizations would be appropriate uh, to do so. I have a couple questions. I We talked about this last Thursday and you mentioned that the PPE request through the ARPA steering group is a placeholder for the future. Um, 
and I'm assuming then that this is irrelevant. It's it's not a, a expense to track down now because we probably have enough PPE. So we wouldn't look right now with the remaining CARES Act money to beef up our PPE. Correct. And I also have a separate federal grant around $10,000 for PPE. The period of performance has been extended to next August. So we still have yet another funding source available to acquire additional okay. PPE if necessary. Then coming back to John's um, point about transportation costs for seniors going to receive booster shots, I wondered about food relief. So holding one here in Halston, I wonder does CARES Act allow for that type of, because certainly last year we were seeing that there was strong, strong opinion from um, the governor and, and others, of course, that you received your flu shot, they mandated it for, for, stu mandated it for students uh, to be in schools after December or even when they're And then we sent them that requirement. Yeah, uh, so I didn't know if running a flu clinic is something that CARES could apply to and or transportation costs for seniors when they get flu vaccine. I know the Board of Health has had early conversations with regards to whether or not they have the bandwidth to, be, to administer mm -hmm. a local flu clinic or whether the model that the schools did last year when they were trying to address the fact that they were trying to get school age children uh, the flu shot and they had a pharmacy come in and administer it and they just advertised it and provided some support staff. So we certainly can follow up with the Board of Health to see if there's a, an appetite for that. Yeah, I, I think it's worth, I mean, if CARES can cover that, it falls within, when, when, the uh, CARES Act money needs to be addressed. End of October. By, right. And normally a flu clinic is early to mid October. <clears throat> if you can explore that and there's an opportunity there, I think we should explore it. I was planning on being up there meeting tomorrow. Right. Okay. Um, I do like re revisiting license relief to businesses, to restaurants rather. John, if I recall correctly, it was four businesses that had a liquor license right. and we offered 50% off the license fee for them. Um, I imagine that a period of economic recovery for them is beyond the, the time period where restrictions are in place, which is what we were responding to at the time. So I, I am interested to know more about that. And for sure, rent and mortgage relief, I, I doubt very much that the community um, is without people who are in need of, um, or in the position of having housing insecurities and then anything related to food insecurity, senior meal program. And uh, you mentioned something about the house and food pantry. And I, I don't quite understand how the money would funnel to them, but there are very creative minds that could make that happen if there was a way to do it. So, sure, similar to the way the CAF acted as the mm -hmm. fiduciary agent for the rent mortgage program, I believe that we could set up a system by which if the house and food pantry because they're in one profit, had a program that was going to address food insecurity in our community, we would be able to partner with them. Okay. So you have a list? <laughs> I'd be happy to follow that through. Do you feel you have clear direction from the board on which direction to go? I do. I just saw the clerk stand. Go ahead. Yeah. Follow up if you're on second. Yes, I am. Yes. So, Mike, um, back to the library question. Yes. The CARES Act summary seems to indicate that there was a phase three package that was related to libraries, education, and cultural heritage. And uh, it included uh, $50 million for um, preparation and response to coronavirus, including grants to states, territories, and tribes to expand digital network access, purchase in internet accessible devices, and provide technical support services under the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Right. So that was the funding source. So if they got it through that channel, then that would be an appropriate expenditure. But the guidance for us through DLS didn't include that kind of program. I know that seems confusing. So in other words, our library would have had to make separate applications. Did they have access to that? Yes. So, so there were some state programs that made certain funding available to libraries. And yes. Do we know if Halston Library tapped into those resources? I do not know. I can check with those. 
seemingly this money went to the state. Yes. And then it would need to funnel through that to the locals. I get it. So it's under that, I hate this word, so we use it's under that tranche. Yes. Ours was strictly CARES is the way you described it, excluding these national endowment for the communities, for the arts, uh, federal libraries, and so forth. In the, same, in. in the same way we've seen some other, it was all under CARES, but it went to different paths. It went to different paths. The same way I would describe it is ESSER that went to the schools, yeah, was under CARES, but it was a separate, okay. So I guess this just opened up a different question now to find out if Paulson Libraries ever had a chance to look at right. those resources or other things. So obviously it doesn't solve the math here, but right. open up a question that I don't want to sure. address. Thank you. Absolutely. Do you, you I don't think there's a motion here. You have enough direction from right. the board to contact the other departments to say, hey, look, if you have something that you had put forward and we'll put forward again under CARES or had something waiting in the wings to go ahead and do that. I have consensus. What about an electronic messaging board? Those, uh, our friends at DLS were very negative about those. I believe I have an opinion from somebody says a wild all expense. Yes, I, I do. I, I, I do. do. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, Mike. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, so briefly, I wanted to, to pivot from closing out CARES, which we need to do by the end of October, to ARPA, which we have a very long runway for. And uh, just, this is a high level summary. I know in your packet, you've got all the requests that have come in to date, some notations of what has already been authorized by the board. Uh, but you see the funding that we have received. And again, as we mentioned the terms, and because this is a federal program, we have all sorts of acronyms. Uh, we have the non-entitlement unit, which means that we are not a metropolitan community. And then we have the uh, abandoned county funding. And those are the two um, portions that have come into us so far. So we received about $2.2 million of our ARPA funding. The board to date has obligated $1.76 million of that. About three quarters of a million dollars for the current fiscal year, and then the balance in the subsequent fiscal years, which means that we have just shy of 60% that is unobligated. So the question is as the ARPA steering group continues to receive applications on a rolling basis as it reviews that which has already come in, as well as the list of shovel-ready projects from our uh, engineer. And also, as we know that there are some dam issues that are in the wings, is there a philosophy of operations that this board wants the ARPA steering group to consider? Do you want to set aside 50% of ARPA for capital and for infrastructure? Do you want to guarantee a third of it gets used for educational purposes? Do you, do you have an overarching expectation of how it is that we're going to um, use this funding as a community over the next couple of fiscal years? Or are we going to deal with it on an application by application basis? So that's the let's open up the conversation just as i looked for direction a few minutes ago on how to close out cares what, what's your expectation of how you are going to administer 4.3 million dollars of our profit fund? so i'm going to piggyback on your introduction there and just make reference to a call i had with representative Dykema this afternoon and the overall message I received from the representative is that they are, our state reps are actively seeking infrastructure projects, capital projects from communities uh, for consideration with the state's ARPA funding as well as potential infrastructure um, funding from the federal government. Um, I think the, the matching message is that this is uncharted territory and there are a lot more unanswered questions than there are known questions. But given the conversation that I had with Representative Dykema and her strong encouragement to submit to her office 
and I assume also Senator Spilka's office, a list, a wish list of all types of capital and infrastructure projects. My reaction after that call and hearing what you're saying now, if we're talking philosophically at this point in time, would be to get that list in to the state, to our state reps and wait on a response because there's so much unknown, again, in terms of the 5 billion that the state has for ARPA funds and the what is anticipated to be a large infrastructure um, uh, vote or, or funding coming our way. So that's interesting to me. <laughs> when you talk about 60% unobligated, well, I wanna hear what John and Ben have to say, but I wanted to share that conversation with Representative Dykema. Uh, she also sent me a sort of a summary email that has all sorts of different ARPA type expenses that she's hearing from other communities. I won't read through the list, um, but the message I got was to be creative and to be broad as we consider what to submit to our state reps for uh, ARPA funding from the state and infrastructure funding from the federal government. So to me, it seems, well, again, I don't want to jump the gun. Let's hear what everybody has to say. 60% unobligated is a good number to start with, I think. 40% obligated right now with the decision on full day kindergarten, so we're 60% on obligated. What does that come out to be per dollar amount, do you know? Uh, $2,603,112. $2,603,000. Yes, sir, please. Yes, sir, please. You're, you're so, ready to go. Uh, yeah, um, so when it comes to those federal programs, um, there's a certain, I feel they're in it. Mm -hmm. um, they may be pulsed in a different time frame than you know, ARPA is. In other words, maybe on the back end of ARPA. Um, but by the time they come, I can envision doing the same thing with ARPA that we're doing with CARES, where if we get this pot of money from the state to do all of Route 16 over mm -hmm. with sidewalks, mm -hmm. and that costs, say, five million bucks, or actually, say, it costs three million, and we put it on ARPA, what well, we move it from ARPA onto this. this Infrastructure, we, we, we move it around, provided it was enabled, and I'm sure it will be. So that's one thought. Um, I wouldn't inhibit your idea that just because we have ARPA, we shouldn't also think of big projects for the infrastructure. I'm concerned that we've blown through 40% of ARPA in about a month. I think it's too fast. Um, and I'll share with the committee when we meet next that pulsing these requests uh, from rolling applications to more of a prioritized uh, application might be a pivot you should think about. Um, there are items on here, for example, that I believe are timely. Um, the cleaning and sanitization that the chief put forward, that has to be a detox thing that you do uh, over the next three to five years. But yet there are other items that are, they're nice, but do we really need to spend money now or can we wait months from now or perhaps a year from now? This money has to last us three years. Um, so I think it's important on this board to pulse that expectation. With 4.3 available over three years, is it wise to go through more than a third of that in a year, just as a broad benchmark? I think that's where the chief is going. Should we consider maybe um, prioritizing some of these items? Should we consider um, pulsing them, as I said, in a way that says, in year one, we're going to address sort of the echo of cares, put in place the items that we know have sustainable and impactful um, uh, value over the next three years, and at the back end, do more cleanup pieces. Um, there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but I'm personally concerned that 40% is done already. We've gone through a lot, and there's more looming. If you look at some of the requests that are down stream, including the home, home repair pro program, that's a great program. Um, we need that right away. Um, repairing COVID, um, English. SEL and learning gaps for HPA students. It's a great item. It's about $100,000. So those will add up quickly for a program that just started. Um, so it's just something that concerns me. And I think personally, I'm going to advocate for more of a pump the brakes approach. Um, it's not a no, but maybe our group, for example, doesn't meet every week. Maybe we meet every month. Um, and we assess the ones that are coming down the pike that seem to have the highest priority at this time. What do you think of that? So when I think about recovery, right? So requests that are tied to recovery, whether it be uh, educational, economic, 
um, the ability for people to stay in their homes with like the senior program uh, for home repairs. I think why would you delay on the public? So I, I see I see absolutely what you're saying about not moving quickly. So you just prioritize. Well, I would I would categorize those as recovery. I would agree. Right. So I would need a justification as we talk about this very high level John, right? We're not talking about any one particular request. Sure. No, I did that's exactly the point. Yeah, I would say that I would need a justification for why you would delay on any initiative, any request that, that starts a recovery process. That's just sort of my initial thought. But I, I could not agree with you more that um, pumping the brakes is, is a very good idea right now. Um, I don't feel a great rush to make a decision because I'm just trying to pick out a good example here that hasn't yet been approved. Let's turn to Ben, see what Ben has in anything. Pressure. Like, no. No, I'm just, um, no, I mean, I, I, I'm inclined to agree um, that, you know, it is, this money has to last us and we do, you know, maybe we do prioritize recovery and then when we get to later on, we can go more towards some of those other projects. Um, um, I, I am happy to see as well, there's some placeholders for those PPE for sanitation, cleaning and sanitizing and for potential, you know, FEMA, if there's any issues there, I think it's important that we think ahead a little bit and understand that, you know, this is probably the last money we're gonna get for dealing with COVID. So we wanna make sure that you know, if something else comes up in a year or two, we're not, we haven't blown through all the money to, uh, to get us there. Um, you know, certainly there are some things here, potentially recovery thing items. Yeah, I can certainly see that. Um, one of my concerns, I, I brought it up before, um, ARPA might not be the most appropriate way for it. You know, we talk about dams. I just, the only reason I, I'm not saying it should be ARPA, I don't know. Um, it's certainly probably be more appropriate in an infrastructure bill. Um, I just, my only concern about those just in general is that we don't have a funding source for it. That's what I'm concerned about those. Just making sure because they could be potentially uh, expensive and we have an alternative means. That's just something that I personally am in favor of, but um, not at the expense of some of these other recovery initiatives. And if I could, with regards to both your comment as well as one that John had made earlier, uh, this really is a game of 3D or 4D chess. So it might be that by deciding as a community that we wanted to do that section of Route 16, including sidewalks, that that freed up local funds that had originally been earmarked per se for that project that now become available for the dams that were previously unfunded. Absolutely. So it's, it is sometimes moving yes. things around holistically for the betterment of the community. Well, and that's really where the importance of uh, the five-year capital plan, and thinking about some of these things and thinking about the infrastructure holistically, I think is so important is to be able to sort of look at those bigger picture items in that way. So we can see, you know, maybe it is more appropriate to move some money towards the past. The, cha or, 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 excuse me. the challenge I think we're gonna see though, is that every community is doing the exact same thing, which is gonna drive up some costs on things that we might've been able to get you know, at reasonable rates before, now suddenly we might have to pay a premium to because the, uh, the vendor is very busy. Town hall septic being a town hall, town hall is a great septic is a great example of something like that. So that's certainly a concern. So I mean, I guess like overall, I don't like I, I, I like what John had to say with you know like prioritizing. Let's get through things that are of a higher priority now. Let's think about this thing as a long term. Yeah, I'm bringing up the idea of meeting less frequently so yeah. that as the ARPA requests come in through the chief, the steering group is looking at maybe a larger batch of items right. that it can organically prioritize because that's what they're there for. Um, they're there to make sure that the essence of what the, the ARPA grant is there to cure gets the right attention. But if we suddenly feel that through this board, um, the direction is to really start pushing through those items that have the most uh, imminent and, and, and urgent need, they get through. It's not no on the other ones. It's not maybe not right. Now. It might just be yeah. It might just be like maybe next year. And that's the way the decision making flowchart was designed. Was that there were several off ramps. There was the seed alternate funding and get back to us. There was also the, what we referred to as parking it for a while. So we, we certainly have the flexibility right now with a request that's come in to let them know we're 
pump on the brakes. We're not saying no, but we're not fast tracking it at this you point. Know, three months ago when ARPA merged, I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be great to get one or two public works projects into this because that gives the kind of relief you talked about. Now I'm thinking differently. Things have changed so fast in a matter of three months with the infrastructure bill. I inherently don't want to see an infrastructure item on our book right. because we have access potentially with Tina just talked about. Sure. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you, John. What's missing? Is there anything missing? What's missing in your mind on this existing list of 19 remaining items, it looks like, or requests, I should say. Is anything missing? So in terms of your comment and then your comment to, to the brakes to slow down to meet uh, less frequently. Are I, you I don't mean to be dramatic, but I have a really sober answer to that question. Mm -hmm. What's missing is the unknown. Uh, we don't know what the pandemic's going to look like a year from now. We all optimistically think it's starting to vaporize, but who knows? We have three more years of the land the variants comes along, Thank you. or something. We just don't know. Team um, to not have the resources to handle that. So that was $1.2 million of spending, right? So we have 18 months worth of a very active pandemic response, um, health emergency, public health emergency crisis, state of emergency local, uh, and so on. We have 18 months of, of history there on what it cost the town of Falliston to manage as, as well as we did. And it was 120,000 of cares left unspent. It was around $1.2 million. I, I, I mean, that would be my <laughs> pragmatic. If I had a crystal ball, I'd say, look, if things really didn't improve in terms of the pandemic, we're looking at $1.2 million of potential expenses to get us through for 18 months, really. But that's not the point of what we're talking right. about. Right. And we certainly can look from reports and figure out yeah. specific sector uh, usage. Like we can figure out how much did it cost for us to support the regional vaccination clinic. So that if we mm -hmm. needed to ramp up that kind of a regional response mm -hmm. again, how much would we need to set aside for that? So we've, we've got a lot of data, but I, I agree. Um, it's it's important not to blow through this all in the first three months. I've, I've seen some, and, and last week, uh, John had asked about the reporting requirement for August 31st, and I double checked that. That's for states, territories, Metropolitan cities and counties with a population that exceeds 250,000 residents. So, as an NEU, we're not responsible for that, and and they have to come up with their recovery plan performance report covering the period of July 31st to August 31st by the end of August, and then every 12 months afterwards. But we're as an NEU, we're not on that report side. Just to give you a small benchmark during my day job. That ACF number for me is $137 million. And we're already letting our clients in, in, in that space know they're going to be a lot of about 10% right out of the gate for this purpose. If we recognize it's going to last three years. I, I've seen some best practices in terms of information sharing from League of Cities and that sort of thing. And I, I'm dismayed at the volume that some communities have already allocated and committed because to the clerk's point we don't know what's coming down the road this winter next spring so, so. yeah I, and I, I completely understand and, and support what you're saying in terms of what's prioritized recovery but recovery i mean talk talk to the folks who just got impacted by hurricane ida mm -hmm. they have still been in recovery mm -hmm. for 16 years from katrina so recovery is not a always a, a quick thing that's done in six to 12 months. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would be my one. I don't think anything that I would refer to as an immediate benefit in terms of recovery would amount to, to significant knowledge anyway, based on what I'm looking at here on this list of requests. But I think that would be my one comment is that if, if, there's, a, if there's a sense from the proponent of the request, the person coming forward and making the request that, that this, this request is tied to recovery that starts when this money starts flowing and this initiative or, or a project gets underway, that that that'd be elevated um, a little bit higher, but I think you guys would do that anyway. Um, how you've done it to date. That's why full day kindergarten was advanced because that had a, a, a 
immediate imminent start date. So look, I'm totally on board with pumping the brakes. So what I'm hearing, John, um, and then I don't hear any disagreement with you is that you meet less frequently as a steering group. It's not just week, right? It's week, it's week Wednesday. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring the topic up to the committee. I'm sure Chief, will, you're on the call anyways, but you'll fill traps and then I think what we'll try to do is let the um, let the other members know we're, we're, we'll meet less frequently, but when we meet, we'll have more to talk about and it may lend itself to that, there's not really a better organic or that thought the process of, of, of prioritization. The only other comment that I would make, and we'll, we can talk about it now or when we get to the fall town meeting discussion, is there are one, maybe two sure. items on here, two items on here that potentially come up on the fall warrant. And I know Travis will want a direction mm -hmm. prior to the warrant closing as to whether or not those are being referred funding, other funding sources, right. whether those are being funded or whether those are being advanced to and the award. So I'm going to ask um, either you or John, the Trails Committee's request for FIPS tunnel drainage improvements, there are two. Uh, did that get? I, it was you asked for more information. You asked them to go to CPC, so it could potentially show up on the town meeting warrant. Not for fall, because CPC has already met and has made their recommendations. So he recognizes that he's probably missed his opportunity to get on the fall um, warrant through CPC. The other one is the traffic monitoring equipment, and also I think. Wasn't the manager the first one? Also potentially a the wastewater treatment plant study. Yep. So I think that's potentially a point of conversation discussion tonight is whether or not we want that to those requests to be considered at the September 8th meeting or whether John the pumping of the brakes means hold on those for consideration. Or bring them through the capital process for the town meeting. So I'm open to having that conversation. Um, I have my own thoughts, but um, is the warrant closing on so the 20th? 20th. Of course, I mean, you can open it, but you know, we have to probably can make a decision on that with the 28th with the steering committee. Um, Travis is direction. Um, Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine with waiting. I'd like to hear what the stranger wants um, for the China. There's no desire here tonight to consider removing any of these requests off of the ARPA steering group's work list? I don't think so. That's the direction I need. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move on to warrants. So, uh, John, can you get a warrant for you there? Make a motion to approve the warrant. Ordered $53,983. Motion. Is I will second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 That carries. Okay. Anything else under warrants? Let's go. All right. So, warrants number 22. Yes, Jay. I have a question. Please. Going back to ARPA. Oh, I'm can sorry. Yes, no, sorry. Absolutely. Can we go back to that? Yes, we are. Yes. Come up to the table. Sure, to the kids' table. Yeah. So, Jay Robinson, 233 Chamberlain Street. So, before I forget, um, when you were talking about infrastructure, infrastructure is covered under ARPA, right? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. So, going back a couple years, um, I know this will resonate with John. Um, on the Edart Bridge project, uh, when Gill Engineering was out there, I'm going to say anecdotally, so I don't need the town anything. Um, he noticed one of the bridges near the, uh, well, I say, yeah, the um, bridge, which is really the, the, the dam, whatever that runs under the road to the um, Edart Bridge. He took a look under there and again said anecdotally and said, rotting. It was interesting. Yeah. So I'm, um, not a qualified engineer, so I am just reporting again anecdotally that what he had, um, Dan Crobo had mentioned is that there, like for larger spans, there was funding to do studies to assess whether you know any remediation needed to be done. But 
um, are like smaller bridges, which um, that span from the ARH bridge was like there was no funding. So that could be a potential use as some of these kind of like orphan uh, spans that are around town that may you, you you at least be using the money to be aware. You may look at it and then say, all right, um, we're going to take a risk based approach that's 15 years before we have to worry about it. But um, and then that would potentially dovetail off of the longer term infrastructure as. So that particular bridge on Woodland Street is also tied to the question of dams. Because I, I think it's an open question as to how much of the bridge is integral to the dam itself. I could be yeah. way off on that, but that's my recollection from conversations. I'm way off on that. The underlayment is um, steel structured, and I don't know how long ago it was done, maybe the 80s, maybe. Um, it is completely rotted. So it's really, if it's inner, it must be integral to the dam itself. Yeah. But what's holding the road up has nothing to do with the dam, right. it has to do with the broaded. And it is because they paved it last year and then almost immediately, probably around the time your engineer saw a sinkhole developed, right, where that rotted area was. So DPW is aware of it, and I couldn't pretend to know Sean has it on, on a ticker list that shows when those things should be dealt with. But uh, Jay's right, it's, it'd be a nice, tidy project for our or infrastructure, as yeah. the case may be. Yep. And that's one where, um, again, when does it need to be done? Not sure, but it would probably be a good use of money. And I don't have an inventory of all those types of bridges that are around town, but uh, damn it. We could route the traffic around that uh, abandoned roadway that's right in here. Yeah. Have you seen that? I heard they 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 were, there or whatever it was back then. I'm sure they just, as long as the fire truck doesn't need to go over it, right? You, truck exclusion down that road, right? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. There, I think I heard a story about. Uh, Equipment going in that area, and uh, yeah, back up. yeah, perhaps. So, so, anyways, just call. Just that's a, that's a call out there. And then the other question was more. So, I'm asking as a citizen, even though I'm on the finance committee. Uh, anyone that watches the fun finance committee meetings would know that um, we discussed uh, full day kindergarten, and we're waiting to have the opportunity to talk to the school committee. Um, because of questions around how do you keep that, you know, from a funding perspective, sustained. So when you look at the monies that you're going to spend through ARPA, are you looking at them as discrete? Because um, as a as a participant and someone, anyone that was a spectator to the finance committee meeting, you would probably hear that questioning around how after a certain period of time that full day kindergarten is sustained. For now, it's it's covered under ARPA. So, is there a discrete methodology or a like potential like okay, we're gonna start with ARPA and then here are some ideas to continue the recurring. I think we all have an answer. It's probably similar but slightly varied. John has hand up first. So. I sit on those committees, Jay. Um, the the impact of any annualized cost from ARPA on town finances when ARPA expires is a prominent question on every item that comes before the steering committee. Uh, the chairman of the finance committee is on that steering committee. He made it a point on two different occasions to, in my words, pressure the schools into recognizing that the decision would have that kind of an impact. I asked the chairman to uh, consider the fact that we are not there to make decisions, yay or nay, on whether or not an impactful annualized cost should be a reason to say no. The reason we said yes to that, Jay, is because ARPA gives and delivers during the grand period resources to recover lost educational value for children of that age. So we met the test of the grant. It's an easy, easy item. But to answer your question, the annualized impact is something that everybody has their eyes open on. But because that item is so big, the, the schools made a statement that they're very mindful of the impact it's going to be. They're going to yeah. work towards a solution. That solution may or may not be within their financial reach, but when it yeah. comes, it will be a financial reckoning. Okay. the community the community needs to make yep. but again going back to the discussion just my opinion the way the chair of the finance committee couched the question i thought was unfair because it's almost as though he was trying to say fear not don't make this decision because it'll have a large impact three or four years except now when the grant ends yep. don't do it that was not the purpose behind the discussion so two different things we're very aware of annualized costs 
but in this case, the idea of not using the federal grants to achieve an educational goal was really not in play. Jay. So it was used to, so the money in that case was earmarked for something discreet, like the intention was to cover the, the gap uh, in learning from COVID. And right. Did you get the impression that there was a and date, like, because to me, discrete means it has a start and an end date versus yep. recurring. Um, know, I believe recurring. you can correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, but I believe the superintendent indicated she had pre, um, pre action measurables, like how many children and what the edu educational decline was. Yeah. And then she'll have to monitor per ARPA the progress of the grant um, funding against those children during full day kindergarten over the next three to five years. So she's going to have to prove that the investment paid the dividends that was invested in, envisioned. And is that correct? Yes. And, and because the ARPA funding needs to be obligated by December 31st of 2024, the ARPA portion of covering tuition free full day kindergarten was phased. And so it was a percentage the first year, it was a lesser percentage the second year, it was a lower percentage the third year, at which point ARPA drops off. Yeah. And the school did have a plan for years four and five, which were outside the scope of the steering group to be able to make a recommendation for the board to authorize funding. So the schools had a plan but did recognize that after year five, it did really need to be fully absorbed into their operating budget. And it would need to be a community discussion based on the percentage of the overall district and therefore also town budget. Okay, so you voted for it as a discrete item saying that you assumed there would be a start and an end to- There is a start and end to the funding. Yes. And Everybody's eyes were wide open, Jack. Okay, we understood. Yeah, so I'm just using this like as an example of when you look at how you're spending money, are you signing up for something that's a recurring spend, or are you using the money saying that it's this for you to start an end date? Like, hold it. Okay. Jay, I do have a question about um, the school committee coming to talk about full day kindergarten with the finance committee. So I was asked this question by a resident you know, how can you justify the use of ARPA funds when in five years? phases out yeah. in less than five years it phases out and you're still left with the question of what kindergarten what have you basically what have you committed the town to yeah and my answer was we've committed the town to what we should be doing every year which is three to five year planning between the finance committee the school committee and the select board okay right like the, the type of tri board meeting the type of planning that should yeah. be going on best practices and the like at the start of the budget process every year so I would welcome the conversation that the finance committee is looking to have with the school committee in terms of full day kindergarten into the future five years and beyond. I would welcome that at the tri board meeting. I think that that's an important conversation to have among the three boards and committees so that we can have that long range planning. I'll update the committee tomorrow. They're probably watching this as yeah, we speak. And yeah, I don't think, I mean, the idea yeah. of a tri board is, is not, not new at all. Right. Um, right. I see that as the place to have the conversation for what happens five years out. So ARPA yeah. started the conversation. Yeah. ARPA won't be the answer in five years. Yeah. So we're looking for the answer in five years. And that yeah. seems to me to be the type of agenda item for a tri board. Okay. I think you answered my question. Didn't mean to take us down a no. rattle of the school no. committee, but just no. look. Two different two different examples where with the bridge it's a mm -hmm. study that has a the study has a start and an end date and you know that that's it um, where it's at least the the deliverable is insight um, whereas the other option was one where like you had said that other people are looking at it as a little less um, of a start and finish type spend situation mm -hmm. and the answer that, that I heard from John is that you look at both there's another item that's process. right in front of us right now which is remote um meeting tendencies it's, it's all funded through cares and, and arpa yeah. um i think everybody has their eyes open and it's not going away it's the, the way we hope public meetings are after arpa's gone and after the pandemic's gone yeah but to pay for that well it wasn't even allowed i'd asked the clerk that yeah, when i was right. running the orange bridge project 
because I was traveling. But again, for work, funding so. it with the expectation that when the funding goes away, what happens to Justin? Which, what happens to those resources? Well, we expect the town to have to reckon with that because we like this idea. We think it will keep going. I think that ties into the question mark of the unknown because is the state going to uh, unwind that and go back to like you, we don't know, right? Well, don't very much. And, and even cleaning and sanitizing. I mean, that's why we have the placeholder in the ARPA right now. But at some point, that's either going to need to be embedded into department operational budgets, or we're going to have to change expectations of employees on the public right, as to yeah. the environment that they're going to be walking into. Cool. All right. Thanks, Jen. Go back Thank to my corner. Back to the little stable. <laughs> uh, all right. So We'll put that as a first public comment we can see tonight <laughs> under the ARPA agenda item. And so, John, do you have any public comment for this? No, good thing. Okay, Ben. Um, just the uh, same one I had last week, which is to remind everyone about Halston Farms Day on Sunday, September 12th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's taking place at a number of farms throughout our community. Uh, we are a to farm community, and there's lots of places that are engaging and um, want uh, people to participate where they can, and they can find out more information on this website. Uh, I have three things. One, the first is that um, I'm happy to say that on Wednesday of next week, September 1st, we'll be interviewing two potential candidates for the assistant town administrator position. So thank you to the screening group that um, has advanced a couple of the applications forward and we'll update uh, residents that we are moving forward to find a highly qualified, good fit for the town hall senior assistant town administrator position. So that will be Wednesday the 1st. Um, start school, for those of you who are parents, your moment to celebrate is coming on Wednesday, um, first day of school for the house and public schools. And that September 12th, there's going to be a cornhole tournament at Blair Square during the farmer's market itself. So first game starts at 10.30. You are encouraged to bring your own cornhole and your own team. There are prizes for the top two teams. So sounds like, I haven't been in a while because we've been on vacation for the weekends, but it sounds like the farmer's market is going strong and we'll continue. Despite to, Mother Nature. Despite, yeah. yeah, it was a pretty rough couple weekends yeah, there. Yeah. Um, and so this goes through the fall, the farmer's market itself. Into October. Yeah, mid to late October. Right. Maybe. So there, you're sort of switching gears to some fall time activities, cornhole tournament. We're hoping to get a little bit more traction. We're not getting as many uh, people signing up as we had hoped, so that's why I asked for the plug. Okay, so people they do want to sign up, they're going to register by emailing Aaron Anderson at Halston Mark Farmers Market at gmail.com. I guess you can contact the town administrator if you miss that email, but um, it's probably on Facebook as well. So that was the second of two, though that was the third of three. So I am all set. So any public comment? Uh, here in the room or on the Zoom call. I am not seeing any, so we're going to move on then to comments from the acting town administrator, Chief Cassidy. It's only been a couple hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah not that. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably good. Did you apply for any grants today? Uh, I did not, okay. nor did I receive any uh, funds for gifting notes. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Well, you know, you have some work to do this week then. Um, all right, then we're not going to have any comments from the acting town administrator, and we're going to move into fall town meeting warrant development discussion. I'm just pulling up my notes here that are in our agenda packet. The capital sub. Oh, so I did talk to the chair of the school committee, and I think it's their intention to come before the select board. <laughs> Sometime after September 9th, I think they meet to vote on their any any possible capital request. Not saying I know one way or the other if they have any, um, but I think that they had a vote for the 9th ending, so we could expect to hear from them probably sometime after that. Yeah, it's my understanding that the budget subcommittee had not met, therefore they didn't have a recommendation as of their meeting last week, which is why the first opportunity they would have to vote. Placeholders or any new initiatives not currently as a placeholder would be on the right September. And there was a meeting with town council, Kate Federoff, on Friday of last week. We're removing the potential zoning, solar zoning article from this draft. 
tax request. We don't anticipate one. When does the capital, the town, town capital subcommittee uh, meet again? Well, you're looking for that, Ben? Yeah, I, I can't find anything posted. Um, I believe it was left last time that there might be. I mean, we went through most of the. Through most of the, uh, the uh, requests. I think the lease. They were open here for the police chief yeah. in regards to cruise requests, and they want to hear from Mr. Reese. So I think we just um, um, so basically the short answer is we don't have anything planned at this time. Okay. But, well, I, and for a minute, I'm going to circle back to what Jay Robinson had to say when he brought it up to the table about the Woodland Street uh, Bridge. Jay? Yep. Uh, Travis does have that tagged on a possible ARPA capital list. Thank you. Uh, and then we have a potential article for sidewalk design engineering or design big build on the draft warrant here and the tier two project list is supposed to be submitted by september 1st so assuming sean uh, is still on target to do that uh, i think we'll have some more discussion once the state approves our tier two list and could in theory and probably in all practicality pull a project to offer that approved tier two list to use as the project um, for that sidewalk article. I don't see anything else worth getting into right now unless John or Ben you guys have anything you want to bring up. I would also point out it's in the packet, but previously you had discussed the potential for a citizen's petition to be based on the conversation with council uh, town administrator and the second one. There's nothing been turned into the clerk yet, but right. it was just something that he heard from a conversation with someone at the council. So no surprises. Okay, no surprises, but I okay. I'm wondering if this was added after our private meeting. Thanks. Okay. Well, it is what it is. We get it in time or we don't. So I don't know that we really have to discuss too much. Right no, now. no, there's no substance to it, but mm -hmm. uh, just as a follow up to the questions last week about if the signatures are certified, does it have to go on? Even if the board thinks that it might not be binding, or those sorts of questions. So could be a second. Yes. Okay. And the deadline for a citizen petition to be submitted with the necessary signatures is September 20th. I am confirming that. Okay. 4 p.m. Okay. Well, I <laughs> short discussion there. So we're going to move on to board business, of which it does not look like we have any. We don't even have to back in there. You usually have a folder. Of I don't worry. Okay. Shape this way. So no board business to discuss. And then we're number eight other business. John, do you have any other business this evening? No, ma'am. Ben, any other business? Not so. Acting town administrator, Chief Cassidy. Uh, I have none unless I know the town administrator wasn't sure if he wanted us to have a camera discussion now or if we want to let that work its way through other groups and committees. When you say camera, you're not referring to the IT request for the board member. You are talking about the traffic monitoring. Which is before both the ARPA steering group as yeah. well as a placeholder on the town meeting article track request. Right, and um, it has not yet been discussed at the Arctic Steering Group, but it has been discussed in the Capital Subcommittee. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of detail here. There's a lot of history with this request. It is not the first time it's come forward. Um, and the connection is, in your mind and others, mine included, is, is there. It's, it's strong to why 
traffic monitoring equipment falls under ARPA in terms of recovery and, uh, and such. So do you want to make- And at the same time, an argument could also be made that it is the fulfillment of a project that was started several years ago because when public safety officials were meeting as part of the design phase of the downtown signalization process, the one request that law enforcement was making was traffic preemption and cameras. And they were assured, absolutely, it's in the project, it's in the project, it's in the project. The equipment got installed, there was still money left over, there were punch lists. Public safety said, okay, you're pretty much done with your punch list. And we move forward with the cameras, and then we were told it's not part of uh, the way the language was approved to town meeting to authorize the project. Therefore, the next phase came in with preemption equipment for public safety vehicles, and we coupled that with the camera request that had always been the expectation of our culture from the beginning. Those two requests were decoupled due to funding restrictions. And that's why we're fully built out with our traffic preemption, but the cameras for monitoring remain extant. So holistically, one can see this as the fulfillment of a project that started over five years ago. One could see this potentially as a capital request in it of itself. One could see it as a potential linkage to ARPA. So so one of the pieces to ARPA, one of the overarching goals of ARPA funds are to improve the resilience of the community to future pandemics. That is one of, well, do they even limit it to just pandemics? Or no, it's future... building stronger communities and neighborhoods. A case has been made previously that having traffic monitoring equipment improves response times for public safety when there are issues related to crashes and other incidents. It improves response. And real-time real knowledge. I'll give you an example with, with, with indulge me. On Friday, the police dispatcher received a report from a person driving through downtown that the signals were malfunctioning and that all of the travelers coming at the central and Washington intersection were receiving a green light at the same time. That meant that the police dispatcher had to divert a police officer on patrol to the downtown area to check out that report. One could argue that if they had the system that was recommended and that had been priced, they could have turned their attention to a 46 inch monitor on the wall, selected the central and Washington camera and could have immediately known whether or not everybody had a green or whether someone was misinterpreting traffic patterns. So it's not just improving response times and it, it's real time knowledge of what's going on. Um, and it can be something as simple as uh, seeing an erratic operator going through an intersection or turning. Sometimes they get a call that a vehicle is entering into downtown and whether or not the person is still on the phone talking to the dispatcher can determine whether they knew whether they went straight at an intersection or turn, which can let the cruisers know which direction they need to, to travel when they get to the intersection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, John. Mike, um, well done, succinct recollection as always on the history of a project. I understand that um, some members or a member of the finance committee suddenly is interested in a policy uh, relative to the use of those images and um, how public safety will use that information. Uh, we have an accredited police department. I believe they post this information. Have you spoken with Chief Cassidy about how this particular technology can be adopted into an existing or perhaps written into a new policy to resolve this uh, emerging interest in a, in a written policy. Chief Stone is eager to respond to the queries about how that information would be utilized. He was disappointed that it didn't advance for a funding request last fall at the December town meeting. And there are multiple town buildings right now and other town assets that have 
monitoring equipment on them that have been used from an investigative standpoint in the past. And I am not aware of a single complaint from anyone alleging that their privacy uh, has been invaded well, by these. May, maybe all true, but because we've always done it this way, it's never really a good policy. So if I could, Mr. Agnew, town administrator, sure, through you okay. to the full time TA, yes. could you ask Travis to reach out to Matt? to produce said policy or point the user towards an existing policy that says this is how we use digital media digital information that's available to us and only under these circumstances actually it may suffice it's just an item that i think like you said it, it seems a little you know 10 years ago ish when people were more concerned about the use and the, and the movement of that digital information um i get it but if there's a quick answer and the chief has it in his arsenal let's get it without delay so if you could ask Travis to get that through to Chief Stone, um, I would appreciate it. And also point out just uh, quickly to piggyback on that, that these cameras cannot be used to um, for, for, for ticketing or for red lights. They're not they're not intended or they're not, I don't think it's legal actually. There's no law in Massachusetts to use, to use them in that fashion. So. You, you make a good point though. I, I don't disagree with you, John. You, you make a good point that there's a, a long track record of um, demonstrated trust building behavior by our public safety officials with images captured by cameras on municipal and other buildings. But there's a demonstrated track record of appropriate, um, trustworthy behaviors when it comes to what, what those digital um, images are used for. That, that's very meaningful to me. I agree, policy puts the, the not the nail in the coffin but you know it's the thing that you hang your hat on however i personally would put a tremendous value on, on that track record of appropriate trustworthy management of those images in the past with cameras already in the place in the community, so. and we are not the first community no. to talk about deploying this equipment so i'm sure if he doesn't already have it embedded in, in his policies and procedures that are accredited chief stone could very easily no, get a boilerplate on from a colleague. And then in terms of why ARPA, you have described, provided the rationale that I, I, I again, personally find sufficient to justify it as an ARPA expense, resilience against future pandemics and public health emergencies, as well as strengthening our communities. In, in my mind, and probably many others, there's no way that, in, in every way, does this traffic monitoring equipment also complement walkability, safe access to our parks, to our public buildings, to our downtown businesses, and to our trail. Um, and that is one of the biggest strengths our community had during the pandemic that we had uh, available to our residents. So um, I see this as a very significant complement to all of those things that fall under you know, a strong community uh, during the pandemic. So I don't have an issue. Thank you for indulging me. I, I know that's not a restrictor, so we're happy to have I do. some of this discussion. Yes. Yes. Can I just pick one? Yes. Um, my only concern, I, I, I understand it's, it, it fits within ARPA, um, but given our previous conversation, I wonder if it would qualify as something that we should advance through ARPA or it should go through as the capital, uh, the capital. Process given, you know, is it something? I mean, I'm not saying it's not important, and I'm not saying it's not something we should do, but I am saying that given our conversation previously, it might be something that would be more uh, pertinent for a uh, town meeting discussion as opposed to an article. So, the this has not been discussed at an ARPA steering group. Do you have one of the meetings? That's correct. Okay. So, from this discussion tonight, you would feel comfortable bringing it up for consideration at that. September 8th. Yes. Okay. Is that, I mean, we would get feedback from that. Yeah, and I, I, just, I just kind of wanted to bring that yeah. to, to, to attention. I didn't want it to um, ARPA to shelve it and then it just fades away because I think it is something important. That I just want to make sure that we keep kind of have to keep it on both radars until um, ARPA has the chance to, to know that. And conceptually, the town administrator also indicated that if it wasn't a good match for ARPA, and it wasn't a good match for capital, that it could be its own article. So again, that discussion could be had with the voters who authorize spending. I hope we will discuss that on the 
uh, I look forward to hearing your feedback from that. Um, so that was your other business. I have one other business, it's actually for John and Ben. I just, we haven't checked back in on the idea of um, a 26 police officer. That was something that when we were preparing the warrant for May, we, we said we would revisit again in October. It may be not fair to ask now if Travis not here since he'd be the one to sort of develop how that would move through um, uh, to town meeting to the warrant. But um, I thought, well, why not check in on that? Are, you, are either of you of a similar mind to May? Are you of a different mind to May on the request for a 26 police officer? Do you need more I, time to think my recollection, my recollection is you're right, Tina, you know, there was some echo of a fall town meeting dialogue. Mm -hmm. It was guaranteed, but um, I think it's worth going back into those emails and those okay. chats between the finance committee and the town administrator. I I'm kind of agnostic on where to land on that. I, I guess let's go back to where we left it off. I'm you're bringing up something that I recall had something to do with the fall town meeting. So let's let's chat about it. But okay. I remember having a conversation about it. I mean, personally, I feel it is more of a uh, May conversation, a budget conversation, but that's just my personal opinion. You know what? Then it had something to do with the recruitment cycle. Yeah. I do remember. I do remember talking about it. I, I mean, I'd like to hear, like, if the town administrator or Chief Stone um, has has some opinions about it. I, I would be curious to hear. I'll be at a casual conversation, not the purpose of my meeting with Chief Stone and Lieutenant Thompson and um, Lieutenant Lamy. It did come up at that meeting. The interest was expressed to me to still very much be there. I would say that the recruitment cycle does come to bear. Um, if they have candidates that they could look to hire right now, that may not be the case. But they definitely expressed to me at the time an interest. And this is, you know, I want to say it was early August. Um, so, okay. Um, I will follow up with Travis then, see if we pick up the conversation where we left it off from last May. Thank you. Um, I have no other town, uh, no other business, rather. So we will uh, look to close the meeting. So I'll entertain the motion to adjourn at 8 20, 22. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meg Halston, we will not see you on Monday. Um, it will be the following Monday, the 13th.